Videos recorded at Global HRU in New York City are sponsored by Recruitify, a unique new category of recruiting that connects top recruiters with companies looking to hire exceptional talent. Learn more at Recruitify.com. And what we found is that job seekers are spending about 41% more time in their job seeking decision cycle than they did the year prior. Uh, that's a pretty important stat and that's a pretty significant stat. It means that the job seeker is becoming a lot more intelligent these days. Combine that with uh, each job seeker uh, in 2013 was exposed to 2.8 uh, paid media ads per, per job. Um, in 2014 that, that, that number grew to four uh, tracked media ads that they were seeing before they actually applied for the job. So that's almost double, right? Uh, nearly double. So. In combination with that, you have a workforce now that the economy is starting to bounce back, even though it's a little bit slower than anybody expected. Um, there's a lot of people either you know, exploring job opportunities elsewhere or actively pursuing job opportunities. I think that the number was about 12% uh, in the U.S. So um, if you take all of this in, in combination with one another, you start to see a little bit more of an informed job seeker, right? Um, a, a job seeker that is expecting the experience, uh, like Jerry was saying, to be a little bit more interactive, to be more in their favor, to, to really be able to explore the company that they're applying to. Um, and, to and they want that experience to be just like they were shopping for a home or shopping for a car or shopping for anything on Amazon. They want to you know, understand the company a little bit more before they pull the trigger and actually apply for the job. Um, and this is just growing you know, every day, this, this whole um, idea of the job seeking experience really bringing itself up to a contemporary level instead of being stuck back where it was you know 10 15 years ago um, so what we're starting to see now is uh, a job seeker that is going to go to Glassdoor is going to go to LinkedIn is going to be a job seeker that's very much informed and, and might not even apply to the job if they don't feel that they're a very good cultural fit um, TMP has been around for a long time. We, uh, we've been around for about 40 years. We started in the business by actually posting job advertisements in newspapers. And over the years, we've grown to be um, not only a re recruitment marketing company, but uh, really a software company that, that sells recruitment technology solutions, as well as services and, and, and strategy around the jobs, employer branding, et cetera. So we have our hands in a lot of different areas, and, and we have our hands on a lot of data at this point. Um, what we've been able to discover over the last several years is that you know the market has changed exponentially you know job boards are starting to become a lot less prevalent and and social media has taken over um, thing, things like that uh, people are starting to collaborate in ways that they never have collaborated before in this space so essentially <clears throat> you know when I look at talent brew specifically and where, where it's where it started and where it's gone now um, we started Talent Brew as more of a, a traffic driver than anything, a search engine optimized uh, website for, for jobs, right? Getting your jobs out of the ATS and out there in the search engines, right? We view the search engines as a very critical piece of the whole path of, of the job seeker, right? 80% 80, 80 plus, maybe 85% plus of job seekers are going to Google first to search for their career rather than a monster or a job board. But TMP, um, you know, has really embraced that whole search engine uh, methodology and, and technique. And we've built a platform now that is a career site platform. So what I wanted to, you know, inquire with all of you is because of all of these changes in the marketplace over the last few years, um, we know that job seekers are becoming more intelligent. We know that they're, they're going to Glassdoor, they're going to LinkedIn, they're, they're researching the companies just as much as the companies researching them. What does that make a career site these days, a best-in-class career site? Is, is it still the same definition as it was five years ago, ten years ago? Uh, my, I have an opinion, obviously, of what that means. I'm interested to hear all of your opinion on what that means and, and how, that's, how you really view that progression over the next several years. How is that going to really change for companies? Obviously, um, we, w we work with a lot of big companies, um, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000. Um, that have a huge spend, you know, from a recruitment marketing standpoint. But there's also companies, you know, small and medium-sized businesses that have the same challenges. How do we address those challenges across, you know, the entire spectrum? You know, whether you're a small company or a big company, how do we address those challenges? How does a company really present itself from an employer brand standpoint? Uh, given all these, you know, you have 
Walmart fighting for the same engineers as some startup in Silicon Valley now. And, it, and just because you're Walmart might not mean, you know, that, that guy in San Francisco really wants to work for you as much as he wants to work for that startup. Right, that wants to work at that startup. But the, so these challenges exist. Um, how do we solve for them? And, and what's your opinion on what makes a best in class career site? Um, part of what we started to do last year um, and, and continue to do this year is we've started to, to you know, lessen the amount. You still have those companies that really want that figurehead video out on the career site, you know. But what we've been really trying to push is more realistic content within each in specific job description. So if you're an engineer, in New York City and there's a job requisition that we have in our system for an engineer in New York City, we want to show you what it's like a day in a life, you know, whether it's a video or pictures, what have you, but as real as it can be, and even if it's user generated or employee generated as we like to refer to at TMP, we want to put that content front and center on that job description and it could be very unique per job description so that we're really pushing the envelope and we're also putting together, you know, all the different you know, amenities that you get by being in that particular location. Uh, when, especially when you're hiring engineers, you have to know what they want to see, what, what kind of things they're interested. Right. And if you look like platform of Stack Overflow, they conduct a survey. Stack Overflow is like a question and answer community for engineers. They have, I don't know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of engineers across the globe using it every day. And they do surveys every year why they why their members leave organizations, why they join organizations. And do you, how many of you hire hires engineers? What is the main reason the person is joining the company? Number one reason engineer is joining a company. Interesting project. Exactly. In, interesting project. How often job description tells anything right. about the project? Never. What is the number two? I think it was not even top five. It's, it's just because the people are well paid anyway. So it, it's. <laughs> I think it was location number. Location. Number two. So they don't want to commute. They want to be. It, if, if, if it's like next, next block, it's better. Because they're quite lazy. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're like if they can use their own own devices, all those things, and, and and as well like flexible working hours, those those things. And I don't remember what was the order of those. I think pay was not even like top ten or anything like that. Yeah. And I think none of the things actually that are in the job description are in the top ten. None. Like typically you have there like okay you have to do this and this and this. You have to have this and this and these skills. But they already know that. Like it's not news. That's why like, you, you, almost the title could tell more about the role than the rest of the job description. Yeah, I would agree uh, with Aki's assessment is that um, the type of information that you want up there, especially for, for an engineer, uh, is information around the location, information around the type of work that they're going to be doing, the technologies they're going to be, you know, they're going to be looking at. And, and at TMP specifically, we've had that challenge, right? We, we had this product that we built and sold and we had a very small team of engineers and as we grew we needed to really explode from an, you know a, a software perspective we needed you know to really go out gangbusters and, and get a big team of engineers and, and architects and release engineers etc uh, QA project management um, over the last couple of years we've had that same challenge and we've been able to to implement a lot of different techniques so that we could get in Silicon Alley, very top level engineers so that they can work on our platform and really help us scale the platform to where it needs to go for the future, you know, for today and the future. Um, so, it, and it wasn't through, you know, throwing buckets of money at them. It was really through telling them, listen, we're building a state of the art recruitment technology system. This is the type of technologies you're going to be working with. And we got a lot of people that were really jazzed about, you know, being a part of something that was that big. So that's the kind of, you know, uh, a software engineer doesn't want to just end that project and say, oh, it was just a normal everyday project. They want to be able to say, you know, something on their resume that was really fruitful to their career and they're really passionate about. You know, the, the bigger the challenge, the more excited an engineer gets to work on that. My company, uh, we, we're doing something along the same lines. Uh, even though we're a really large assessment test house, we're, our approach is we're, we're our, our, the founders of our company and most of the people in our company 
are like all from one of the biggest global uh, competitors of ours now, uh, SHL. And so, but our whole philosophy is to be continually disruptive uh, against our competitors because we have a very approach of just be nimble, be different, and kind of figure out what the client doesn't even realize they want yet, but it's going to help them. Right. And so along the lines of what you guys are talking about with um, realistic job content that's specific, and that really is going to draw people in because what do the applicants care about is what matters. Why would I pick this job at this company is what matters. And so one of the tools that we do is it's something that's been around for a while. My training's in industrial organizational psychology. I have a PhD and basically it's a study of human behavior in workplace settings. So my clients are usually human resources people or, or sometimes there are roles like for people like me who are actually HR people. I've been on both sides of the fence. Um, so I've done internal HR and consulting. Uh, but uh, what do you call it? One of the solutions that we now offer uh, that has been really interesting to clients is a short little game quiz that sits on the career site that is a couple of little brief four, five, seven sentence scenarios and uh, with multiple choice questions where they, we ask you, this is what our company is like in this particular role. Uh, and, you know, take this little fun quiz. You don't register yourself. You don't, you don't give us your name. We don't, it's purely a game for you to learn about us, and learn about the job and see if you think this might suit you. And after they answer each question, uh, they get an immediate feedback response of, oh, it's great that you think that, you know, that it would be good if you work at Sunglass Hut to, uh, when the store's not busy and no one's really around, to go stand out in the uh, hall walkway of the mall and offer to clean people's sunglasses. Because being <laughs> creative and, way and coming up with ways to engage prospective customers is part of our culture. Et cetera, et cetera. And then, like, when they finish the little quiz, after they are getting complimented regardless of how they answer the question, but they're getting feedback about whether they are a good fit or not for the job and why they may or may not choose to apply. And we don't know who you are yet. We're just trying to encourage the right people yeah. to want to continue to learn about us and to apply. And then they take that little game and they put it out in their social media and say, come check out something cool, fun, and new to play around with and see if you might like our culture and, our, and this particular job. Uh, and uh, clients love this thing. And it's not some little software thing that someone created with a you know IT department at back. This is a validated psychometric tool that we actually the, there actually is a scoring algorithm in the back end that was uh, done with this, with statistics to, uh, and psychometrics to identify who would be a good fit. And if they're a good fit at the end of the quiz, not only is it really positive and really engaging, but it actually says apply now. And there's a button <laughs> so they can click it and go right in if they choose. Uh, and for everyone else, it's like, oh, thank you for playing, and it's great that you want to learn more about our company. Take it as many times as you want. Tell your friends. Please come back and explore the other stuff on our site. And so everyone walks away with a positive experience, but you get to not clog, where'd Kara go? Uh, not clog the top of the funnel with people really who should have no business being in your applicant tracking funnel at all. Because let's face it, they are applying for a job that sounds exciting, but it, they don't know what it is. How many people do you think uh, apply for jobs at Google, for example, right. and, and uh, high volume jobs at Google? And uh, if they really fully understood what it was, it's basically a lot of those jobs are basically the equivalent of selling yellow book page ads, right? Because they're, they're primarily an advertising company. That's really where their revenue comes from. But, and if I told you I've got this excellent job, you get to be on the phone or on email and constantly sell advertising, how many people would sign up for that? <laughs> I mean, some do, clearly, but they're getting attracted to the culture of the company without understanding the job. So if you can get them to understand that here's our culture and here's this particular job that lots of thousands of people are applying for, are you sure you want to be a flight attendant? Here's the pros and cons about being the flight attendant, right? Like you might get stuck in Hamburg tomorrow because the plane doesn't work, so you're not going to make it home this weekend. Or, you know, or et cetera, et cetera. So, you, you know, that side of it is pretty neat because it creates a realistic view of what the job is. And yeah. then they can choose if this is what I want to do. And they may like their job, but not this company. Or if I, they might love the company, but can't find a job right now. And so that's a great way of kind of creating some awareness, I think. Yeah, you just touched upon a point. Uh, so uh, as far as assessments, that's an area that I've been looking at for... Um, you know, I wear a lot of hats at TMP, but one of the hats I, I wear... Um, in, 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 in conjunction with my primary hat is exploring companies to partner with. And um, an area that I've been looking at is assessment technology because um, obviously the, I've heard probably a dozen times today some frustrations with some of the ATS vendors, especially some of the larger ones out there. I'm not going to 
bash anyone. That's not my game. Um, but obviously, that's another broken area, right, is the application process. And what happens in a high volume capacity like that is you're going to get you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of applicants. And they're all going to look relatively the same. You know, they're going to have the same skill set. or It's going to be hard to weed out the one or two that are really the top notch you know, flyers. So how do you really solve for that problem? Is assessment technology the way you solve for that problem? Where um, you know, maybe instead of an application or in conjunction with an application or prior to the application, you are assessing someone based on their skill set. And it could be a psychological test, it could be um, a game like you suggested. And, and maybe that's the way that you really drive quality. You know, the problem with assessment technologies in particular is there's this whole notion out there, uh, much like the time to fill metric and that being a standard across the industry, there's this whole notion out there that they need X number of resumes for every job instead of getting five really solid resumes to get the right person. Um, maybe that we're, you know, maybe we're at the point now where that's going to start to shift over the next five to ten years. But um, essentially, I think assessments will be a very important part over the next, you know, several years to really understand how to get a quality candidate and one that will will, will last at a company for a very long time and be valuable, productive, etc. And happy. And happy. Yeah, yeah. You know, people talk about. I'm just, yeah. yeah, sit up here. I, I got an opinion about this, so I can't get quiet on my apologies. But this is my core area of, ex of expertise, so I have a hard time not commenting. Uh, there's a lot of talk out there right now about employee engagement, employee engagement culture, and the importance of aligning people with culture and employee engagement. And I said, you've got it all wrong. You don't take someone that's in the company and try to give them rewards and try to encourage them to behave a certain way so you're going to have a culture. You hire the people who are going to be a good fit for your culture. Right. which means you have to figure out what it is that makes someone a good fit and attract those people in. Stop trying to tell someone to be something once they've been hired on. You don't marry someone and then tell them, now change. You try to find the person who's going to be like the person you want as your spouse. And if you're not doing that, well, I can recommend you to some Meryl. Can you be, be upfront as well about the fat thing, <coughs> not in the very... Perfect, yeah, right, like absolutely. And that's one of the, the things I was talking about is there's a very old concept in, in HR and it's called a realistic job preview and there are many companies that do this at the entry level manufacturing kind of roles and, and top level roles as well but come along let me show you the warehouse you're going to be working in this is the forklift here you're going to be possibly your your co-workers it, you look at the environment it's noisy it's not so safe etc whatever it is you now know what it is like to work here you have a good idea after following around for a little bit and kind of getting a chance for an hour or two to see the job you know what this job is. You may decide, I don't want to do this. I'm forget it. Or, wow, this is super exciting. But this little game application I'm talking about, we call it a realistic job preview questionnaire. And it is a psychometric tool uh, or assessment. But it is giving the person, before they even decide if they want to tell us who they are, an idea of what is it like to work at X company in terms of culture and this particular job that thousands and thousands of people are applying to. Because I might think it's a brilliant idea to become, uh, like I thought that personally, that being a flight attendant, you know, a cabin crew person, super exciting. You get to fly all over the world, free travel. It's like going on lots of vacations. Then as you learn and find out more and more about the job, you're like, oh, this is a tough job. Not everyone could can't handle being in a different city every week or every day. All right. uh, working with a different group every time you get on shift because you never know who's going to be there. I mean, so, uh, you know, getting a good view of what I would like or not like is critical for the applicant, and most companies don't share any information about it. Right. I, I would agree. Um, and, you know, the clients that are embracing this type of technique for us um, from a career site perspective are the ones that are being, it, they are the most successful. They're the ones where we are putting together, you know, career site data or, or plat in our platform realistic information and, and ways to weed yourself out of the process. So. Um, we're interested in driving the right candidate to that particular job. We're not, you know, uh, obviously we have some clients that absolutely demand volume and volume and volume. And when the volume goes down, they come beating on our door. Um, however, we also have that segment of clients that's starting to get the bigger picture of what's going on. I and mean, we have a workforce that's transitioning right now, right? Um, a, a lot of newer folks, millennials, et cetera, we hear that word all the time, but they're coming into the workforce at a rapid pace and they're used to a world that's you know completely internet driven, right? They're 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 gamers. They're on the internet. They're YouTubers, and um, there's a whole different methodology you need to employ with this type of worker because of who they are. And you know, how many in this room remember the world without the internet? 
Okay, so that's actually a lot. <laughs> it's an old crew. So this might be an old crew, but uh, <laughs> um, however, um, the new crew, you know, doesn't really know the world without the internet, and that's what they live and breathe. And if they go five seconds without their phone, you know, they're they're lost. They don't know what to do. So you have to put things in front of them that kind of embraces who they are. And um, I think they can, you know, obviously we're going to have to rely on them to, to be a major part of our workforce and we're going to have to put the tools in front of them and information in front of them that really allows them to self-identify with positions. So, uh, uh, I love the gamification piece um, in the quiz. Is that mobile friendly? So when they're on their iPhones and tablets and you talk about millennials and you know, it sounds elementary, but I can't tell you countless sites that are not built in with their sponsored design. And these are like Fortune 500 companies, and it's like, it's just not on the priority, yeah. and it's the whole thing. So that's very interesting that it is uh, mobile friendly. So. Yeah, absolutely. If you're not building it to be mobile friendly, then it's kind of defeating the purpose. The trend, just in general, of mobile commuting is such that more and more people are using their phone or tablet of some form to get on the internet especially look at Asia, but that's often the only tool they have. And, yeah. But think about it. Do you really think that applicants are sitting at their work computer applying for jobs? Probably not. They're going off during a lunch break yeah. and applying for jobs on their phone. And so, and, you know, so absolutely, this is a way of attracting people to the career sites uh, through social media. Usually the games are promoted through social media, through friends, not through the corporate eight recruiter types, but, you know, kind of in, uh, in a much more kind of organic kind of a new way. Um, and then they go to the mobile site. And oh, by the way, we, my company, uh, we've got 30 offices across the world. Our tools are translated in 40 languages, depending on which tool we're talking about. Um, but we are moving uh, our core tools and, and eventually many, many of our tools over to be mobile friendly right now. We already have uh, our 360 platform that's mobile compliant uh, and you know able to adjust screen sizes, et cetera. And we're moving a lot of our other tools over as well this year. It's part of our strategy. So there's this whole rift between passive and aggressive candidates, right? There's a whole growing, you know, there's 12% are either exploring or actively yep. looking. So um, what's your take on that, you know, growing divide between the active and passive candidate? What's, what's really more important to you as the uh, HR practitioner uh, or talent acquisition leader um, around that. I, is, it, is it better to have an active candidate or a passive candidate? What's your real view on that? As a anyway. recruiter, I, just, as, I look at a blended approach. So I'm not, I don't think I'm looking for it wherever the best talent is. Right. So you know, I, everything's blended and it's a different approach for who you're trying to hire. Is it technologist? Is it a regulatory compliance person? And you know, where are the, you then casting your net? Right, and tracking where you're getting the, the top talent and what's working. Um, referrals, you know, just a, it's a blend. So I don't, don't care. I look okay. for quality, right, across whatever right. it is. If it's only three different places I'm going because they're proven and I know them, or is it 12 places I'm going? Right. So. But most, most uh, third party recruiters I know won't present an active candidate because they're not going to get paid. Because <laughs> if you can go on Monster and find that person, right. they're not going to get a fee. Right. And that's why, you know, most third-party recruiters are out there looking for passive candidates. I think the real issue with it is there's a stereotype that if somebody's active or they're not working, they're not. Why aren't they working? Oh, they haven't right. worked in six months. And a, a recruiter, unfortunately, half the times just ignores their resume because, oh, the hiring manager doesn't want to see it, hasn't worked in six months. But you don't know why that person hasn't worked in six months. Maybe they took family leave or they don't, you know, without finding the story out, you just kind of pigeonhole in somebody. And unfortunately, that happens a lot. Right. I agree. But the, but the person who is actively looking is available. Like, it's, it's actually way much easier to hire a person who is available. And as, as you said, you need to know the reason for it. There, I don't know, with the amount of technology, active and passive, it goes back and forth because there's, there's no such thing let's say you're at the airport, right, and you're on a business trip, <coughs> you love your job, and then you get a call from your boss, and your they ream started. you out, your flight's delayed, well, you go on your phone, and you just became active. <laughs> and if your jobs aren't out there with the right employer branding, you're going to lose that conversion because it's so emotional. And yeah. so it's the same thing to me, at least. Yeah. I think I think there's no passive active. There's passive aggressive candidates only now. It's like it's like we we monitor people's 
job seeking behavior from the social data. So what we do is basically aggregate all your social activities, we normalize it, what is typical for, like behavior for you, and then we find the triggers that are job seeking related, and then we monitor how likely you are now open for new opportunities ex like externally. And it's pretty scary to look how actually that kind of behavioral changes are there that we, we don't really, we are not really active or passive, we are in somewhere between depending on the month bonuses. and if the bonuses has been paid or the bonuses has not been paid. So. Yeah, or, or a press release just went out in your company that, you know, company A is acquiring company B or something's happened yeah, and stock's going to drop or... To really aggressive. Oh yeah, I was, <laughs> I was at Burger King Corporation a few years ago when it got acquired by 3G Capital. Yeah. And I saw all the recruiters around me suddenly getting really quiet and getting on their phones. And I was like, I wonder what they're doing. And then a week or two later, I saw them all leaving. And I saw, oh, I see what they're doing. <laughs> and yeah, it, it, that happens. One little thing, news, the trend shifts. Uh, an emotional event happens, something that interpersonal with my manager. By the way, people don't quit companies. They quit their boss, usually. Um, so yeah, th those sort of things do drive people out. And by the way, on the on the active and the passive thing, I, I completely sure. agree with you because I think it's sort of a marketing stunt from recruitment agency, nothing more, nothing less. But on the predictive software, so you were you were touching on that now a little bit. Yep. How does that work? Because again, they they I've seen um, a version that um, is used more internally, sure. right? So as a as a talent management tool, and not so much. I think you 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 seem to gather external data as well. Um, so can you tell us, or me, a little bit more about that? I'm not sure, sure if you're interested. Sure. So we, we look at external data, so behavioral data, like social data, that actually is how do you behave instead of like what is the average pay in the industry that is in the HRMS or when you have been last promoted. Because those are typically average based and I have not yet met the average person. So quite often when you're applying those kind of average based, you're all, all the time wrong. And what we, what we learned is that when you look actual behavioral data, it's very easy to find those kind of triggers that can be associated to job seeking. For example, you start connecting with people from the organizations that you would not connect otherwise. And they might be recruiters, they might be hiring to like, hi, like people that can be identified to be like a hiring manager for you. As well, you start to follow career related content. For example, in Twitter, you start to do many kind of like things. We, we currently have 7,000 different triggers that we can identify to be either increasing or decreasing. But then again, when we are not average people, we have to apply what is typical behavior for you. And then basically kind of normalize the behavior. And as well, look historical behavior. When you last changed your job, what kind of things you did then that were kind of associated to this. And it's, it's we are like a chase, like a FICO score, like a credit rating. So you can put that information to your HRMS, use it for uh, flight risk monitoring, or you can put it in your CRM, use it for recruiting. So you can sort your talent database based on the availability information. So instead of just cold calling to the candidates, you know who are the people that are most likely willing to have the discussion. And so I'm interested to hear on the career site stuff. How much content marketing do you do that drives your SEO strategy? A, a ton. I mean, that's our big push uh, this year. was our big push last year. And we're trying to get it to be, be very as personalized as possible, like I was indicating before. But it also goes into things such as, um, you know, you have a, a, a job description where maybe you need uh, somebody that's proficient in Google Analytics, okay? So is that what you write in the job description? Proficient with Google Analytics? Or do you really write... You know, because that could mean different things, right? I could be proficient in Google Analytics at a high level, but what I really need is the guy that's implemented Google Analytics on an enterprise level. That's you know really implemented it, knows it backwards and forwards, knows it probably better than the guys at Google. Well, maybe not better than the guys at Google, but knows it just as well and probably could work at Google. That's the kind of guy I'm looking at. So, how do you change your job description to really find that exact match so that somebody that looks at the job description? doesn't see proficient in Google Analytics, but they see different content that really shows them what we're really looking for is someone that's developed Google Analytics in this way, in this, this shape or form. And 
you know, job descriptions the way we see them, they're always, they always come, they're very cookie cutter. And what we try to work with, with clients is you're going to have that job description, you're going to have the requirements and qualifications, et cetera, but you also have to content market, you know, in other ways, like we were talking about before, through either videos, you know, maybe you have a video of one of the top engineers that, you know, implemented Google Analytics for that company and, and him describing what he's looking for in the position. And that's, you know, Video is the, the, the fastest growing medium in technology right now, so maybe that's the way you deliver that message so that the person can either opt in or, or self-opt out if they don't feel like they really match up to what that person's looking for. There's so many things that you can do and so many tools that you can leverage that is not actually the career side, as like addition to the career side. Uh, but we have to kind of think, okay, what is the, what is the thing that would help us to, to, to do that and there's so there's so many things we see conversion rates you know go through the roof because of realness for, because of you know putting information out there that's that's true transparent you know you have to embrace transparency these days if you don't you know then you're you're it's it's kind of an archaic approach it's a you're a dinosaur you know and um, you have to be able to content market yourself in a very real and factual way. You have to leverage the social media tools that are out there and embrace those tools. Uh, I can't imagine you know, any of you are not on social media at this point. Um, most of our clients are. So it's starting to turn. You know, the, the, the tide is starting to turn and it's starting to become a lot more of a world where I think the candidate is going to have a more active role in the decision of the hiring process. You know? um, is your clients, by the way, having like last door widgets in their career We're actually, um, we're working on that right now, um, but that's something that we, we, we're promoting that to our clients and that they should embrace Glassdoor, whether you have, you know, if you have bad reviews on Glassdoor, obviously we're a strategic company, right? We're going to help you figure out how do we improve your culture, your image, your employee engagement so that people are happier and let's get, you know, let's get the reviews up there. Let's, you know, let's, let's understand um, and, and help people understand it, rather than driving them to all these different places, right? They're seeing four different uh, tracked media ads per per job application, right? That's a lot. Um, let's put that front and center so that there's not, you know, they're not having to go to a million different places to find out about your your um, your they, they employment. They cluster anyway. Why not to bring it right, there? Right, right. Like but yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good idea. Um, for career sites, I think having Glassdoor content is, is very relevant. Glassdoor has become a standard pretty quickly. I think it's a great, great site. Um, and it's, you know, a little bit more than LinkedIn at this point because as far as the information that you can get about an employer, LinkedIn is more of, a, you know, your, the, the employer's advertisement, right? You're not going to get a lot of that raw, you know, uh, reviews. Glassdoor is just no BS, you know, that's what I love about it. And I think, you know, you have to keep in mind that that's, that's really Well, awesome. maybe some BS. But, I mean, less, I mean, less BS. There needs to be some negatives. I mean, it would be a very, yeah. like a big organization with no negatives. It would be a weird as well. It's not a self-promoting. Yeah. Right, exactly. But, but think about it. If you're going to go look for a restaurant, right, you go to one of these sites like Yelp or Open Table or whatever, and you read the reviews, you're going to check out a hotel or something, you read the reviews. And, yeah, there's always the guy or gal who's, like, blasting them because something wasn't right. And then you have to look at the, the kind of many of them and say, okay, is this, I, go, I have an iPhone. I go online before I buy any app or download even a free one because I don't like to have lots of clutter and read the reviews. And if there are you know, lots of people blasting it or if a few key people are complaining about the same thing, I know that that app has a problem. And I don't have to decide if I want it or not, right? And same thing, I go to Glassdoor and say, oh, well, this is a really cool company, really innovative, but oh, everyone who's applying is complaining or all the ex-employees are complaining because the company is a churn and burn company. You're going to do lots of work, really innovative and exciting stuff, and after a year you'll be tired of this and you won't want to work here anymore because you'll hate it. Okay, I don't know if I want to put myself through boot camp, thank you very much. I mean, you know, if that's part of the culture, then people have to know what they're signing up for. Otherwise, what happens? One of the main reasons, if you do exit interviews, which a lot of companies think it's a good idea to do exit interviews, but they don't really do it in a good way, or they don't get anything useful because the candidate, who's the person who's leaving, doesn't really want to tell them anything that could be problematic, so they don't want to burn bridges, et cetera. But they'll sometimes all third parties, uh, but one of, uh, that they'll do surveys instead. But one of the things that uh, tends to come up repeatedly again and again, if they don't stay very long, is a job just didn't meet my expectations for what the job would be and who I would be working like and what my role would be and what the requirements would be, what it would, culture would be like. There was a misalignment. Why? Because recruiters, unfortunately, a lot of us spend a lot of time selling the company and selling the job to the candidate. And then when they get there after a couple months, they're not happy and they decide to leave. 
and maybe they can't leave right away because the job that they're looking for next isn't available. But that's why they go to Glassdoor because they got burnt right. once and now they want to make sure they know what they're getting into before they buy again. It's a sales uh, aspect two ways because, you know, I'm joining your company and you're bringing me in. And if we're not both happy, one of us is going to choose to leave. That's right. the way it works. And so, uh, and when you had mentioned the job description, man, I forgot your name. I'm sorry. Connie. Connie. And uh, uh, what do you call it? You know, these generic job descriptions are completely useless if there isn't anything really tangible and accurate around what does this person really have to do to be successful in the role. If it's so broad and generic because the compensation team created it for pay scale purposes and it wasn't created for recruiting, then in the end of the day, if I'm trying to hire against a job description, I'll never hire the right person because the job description doesn't have the real critical content. The hiring manager knows what, the, what is really missing. So what I do as a psycho uh, consult uh, psychologist, industrial research psychologist, when we're going to build large scale assessment selection tools or uh, build them customer interview guides or anything else along this way, aligns to help them select people. I say, let me talk to the people who are the hiring managers, who are the top performers in the group, and let me interview them and gather what's not written on the job description. What are the things that people don't want to say in the hallway of the company, but it's important that I know so that we can make sure we're hiring in the right types of people and attracting the right types of people and selecting the right types of people for good fit. And it's amazing the volumes of information you can get that way. And by the way, that's called job analysis. No one likes to use the term anymore because it's so old, et cetera. But it's like the core of all HR processes. And it's like kind of like saying that it's not exciting to talk about oxygen and air, but I mean, you know, try living without it for a couple of days. It's not going to happen. Um, a couple minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, it's, it's just like water. You can't survive. Um, the job analysis process of the studying what is it in the the aspects, the tasks, the skills, the capabilities, the competencies, the characteristics, the knowledge, uh, the abilities that, that are required for success in the job. And then, oh, by the way, what's the context of the job and what are the other things that are relevant that we need to know about? And if you don't have a good sense of that first, you're never going to hire the right person in. And if you don't tell the applicant this is what the job really requires and this is what the job's really like, then they might not have a good sense of how accurate their decision should be or, or their accuracy in making a decision of am I a good fit for this job and will I like it? Because if they don't make a good decision because they don't have good information, they may leave. I think um, in addition to Glassdoor, another thing that we're seeing companies do is uh, around social media <clears throat> is running campaigns with their employees and this really gets employees as part of the recruitment process, right? Um, where they can go out and you know do a hashtag campaign or something to that effect and then we can bring in anything that has that hashtag associated with it and put it up on you know on the job description so that a user or a user a, a job candidate that is looking at the the job description can really see you know how active the employee base is with the company from a social media standpoint and this is especially important for um, the younger generation that's all over social media um, so that they can you know, start to really emotionally tie themselves to the company and see, am I really a fit with these types of people? You know, they're going to do their homework, they're going to do their research, and um, having that social media up there I think is just as valuable as a Glassdoor review or anything like that because um, you know, everybody's using social media these days. You can see who's connected to who at the company and you know, really start putting the puzzle piece together on whether or not that company is going to be right for you. So I have my involved as well in one other company that is, is focused on kind of turning around the whole funnel of the attraction. Um, normally it's kind of maximizing the exposure to all the possible people by using referrals, by using job boards, by using all the means. And what we kind of see is that what you get is then lots of people to the funnel, then you have the assessment problem, screening problem, all those things. And there's a million uh, data points that you can look and, uh, and start doing the whole advertisement process very targeted way to all those people that are actually the ones that you want to hire. So from this kind of funnel, you go to this kind of funnel. Then the recruiter actually can do more work that they should be doing, talking to the people, assessing the people, because you get from those hundreds of applicants to tens of applicants. And I think we have to kind of look what we have as a social media is basically directory of people as well. And we can use that directory of people to limit the visibility of the job ads to only those people that we want to see them. And I think we have not done that much yet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I would agree. But we, we still, 
when we talk with the clients, they always, yes, it would be awesome to have less applicants. Then we deliver them less applicants, and they say, oh shit, what happened? <laughs> Like it's, it's still weird for them. And then yeah. where is the million views that we get like for this kind of role last time? Where like our employer branding needs to be visible to everybody. So it's kind of, I think it takes a little bit of time for them and a kind of mindset change that, hey, actually we can apply almost like headhunting methods to also get applicants. So the move, yeah, yeah. And changing the metrics changing the metrics that what, what is actually meaningful. Yeah. And then do we actually need application process in application process? Do we need to have applied? If you have less people that even sees the ad <coughs> that are already like pre-qualified, you can give them options just, hey, poke the recruiter, poke the team members. They can check you out. They can contact if you are relevant. You, you can kind of s skip the whole <coughs> form because you already know about those people anyway. Because they're the people that you choose to target on. And then the whole funnel changes. But I think we, we just, Go ahead, yeah. sorry, finish the uh, we just kind of repeatedly do this, let's get the word out, let's get our uh, job postings to all the possible job boards, free ones and paid ones, and then get a lot of applications in, and then we have a lot of other problems. It's a post, that, that post and pray model just doesn't work anymore. But everybody's still doing it. Yeah, but it just doesn't work. But everybody's still doing it, so let's change it. If everybody, how long we have said that it doesn't work? It, that's a very, a a very, very good point. And, and, and uh, your, your point about then they don't even have to apply anymore because now we know who they are, what they're like, et cetera, and they've just voiced interest because they've poked you or kind of raise their hand yeah. or whatever. But think about it, are there any employment lawyers in the room? Okay, so, no? Okay, so uh, the definition of an internet applicant is a key criteria for all sorts of things when you start getting into like discrimination suits and, uh, and ADA lawsuits and, and all sorts of things around the metric of who, uh, in employment law and who is an applicant, who's not an applicant. Uh, I mean, and so, uh, you know, when you start taking away the whole, well, forget the whole application they process. Don't have the regulational problems because right. actually, if the person is showing interest, you don't have applicants. So you can do a lot of things. You can check them out. You can do. Yeah, um, it's just a lead, it, or it's like a marketing. It'll take probably a right. couple of years, so ten years, or one year, five years, depends how fast the government moves to catch up to to technology. Because, yeah, the whole definition of what's an applicant will have to change yet again. Any other questions? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>